listening to the best podcast available. I'm Jason Gibbs. He is Nick Shook. He is Andrew Gribble. And uh, we had the scary injury, and practice kind of took a little bit of a hit, rebounded a little bit toward the end. But you mentioned it, Shook, uh, the wide receivers on full display, and the quarterbacks would played pretty well today as well. Uh, a good day for the offense. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think the – the product, the result of weeks of work, and with you know with Baker Mayfield and, and the variety of receivers he's throwing to in tight ends, and the offensive line starting to establish some continuity, everything is starting to really come together, and we're starting to see the first like peaks of what this offense could be be as a result of all that work that they've put in. They just seem to be on the same page collectively. The, it's it flows well. I mean, they, they make very few mistakes. Sure, the defense will. You know, Miles Garrett would get around the edge and cause Baker to fumble the ball at the back of the end zone when they start with the ball on their own one yard line. You know, that, that was a tough ask of Eric Cush to make that pull and try and block Miles Garrett out in space. Uh, the, the only thing harder than pulling as a lineman is pulling to make a block in open space because there's so much room for a guy to go around you and you yourself are moving and it's a little bit unfamiliar and you have no protection. So, for him to go out there and try to block Miles, he first got there and got engaged, but Miles went right around him eventually because Miles is the freak athlete that he is. But overall, uh, in you know the defense had its nice moments, but this offense is just really getting a good flow, and they found the end zone a lot in in a red zone period that was super productive. Uh, Baker Mayfield hit Richard Higgins on a long touchdown pass. You had a couple of long runs. Dontrell Hilliard had one of them. Um, it, it's just it looks exactly where you want this offense to, to look like as you get ready to go to Indianapolis and play against another team. So that should be extremely encouraging. Yeah, I thought there was one interesting moment when usually Freddie Kitchens doesn't change the rules of the situation no matter what happens. So say his offense throws a pick on the first play. He's like, all right, you guys are out and you move in. But there was a moment where they did that, I thought. It was this, the slant to Higgins that he took all the way to the end zone. They're like – uh, I think we think you were let, let's just pretend you were down and keep running the offense here. So that was it was almost to the point where you having too many big plays to prevent getting the work that you wanted to get in. And I thought that that's an encouraging sign for the offense. But yeah, an, an exceptional day from Rashard Higgins. Uh, and just uh, I thought Dontre Hood looked very fast. I thought Dearness Johnson made a lot of plays today. I, I thought it was just you, you. There was a lot of different players getting involved. And I think it was almost as if they needed that game on Thursday to really find their rhythm and now it's just kind of normal out here in practice. Yeah, I think this is probably the first or second practice where we didn't need the no huddle for this offense to look fluid, which is really encouraging as well because that's usually when the offense looks at, has looked at its best during this camp is in the no huddle portion. But it's funny, they scored so many times and got so many big plays. Joel, I, I was standing on the sideline, and I heard Joel Batonio at one point wonder aloud. He said, is the defense going to cover today, or are we just going to run down the field all day? I mean, because every time they scored, they're all trotting down, and sure enough, they're turning around and trotting back, and the next group's coming out, and then first team's going to be back on the field again, and you just keep racking up the yards because you got, you know, a 15-minute period, so you get more reps in or more successful reps because you keep scoring. So good day for them. Good day, indeed. You mentioned the running backs, and Johnson was uh, had a good day. Uh, there were a number of guys making plays. Nick Chubb continues to just be in the right place at the right time. And anytime the ball comes his way, he makes the play and then there's a play after the play. And he just continues to impress. The whole catching out of the backfield thing has become like second nature for him. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think he's poised for a big year. That's my, that's my biggest conclusion from this training camp is he has been so involved and so active and looks so good yeah. that he, it, it's all he is really kind of just put it all together and, and really in a position to have a big year if he can stay healthy and, and if, all, if all the offense can stay healthy around him. I think he's in – a really good position. I also think I've liked what I've seen from some of the other running backs. Hilliard I mentioned earlier, but a, a guy that's practiced well, I think I mentioned him in the last pod, is, is Trayon Gray looks like a good running back. Like He looks like someone that can help you. And if you're looking for potential competition for that third running back spot, if you don't think you need another scat back, he's probably right in line there because he is a bigger running back, a potential short yardage guy as well. Perfect example of that today was at the end of practice, the final period, they got into a goal line mm -hmm. situation a couple of times, and they pounded the ball. Joe Carriage lined up at fullback. Trayon Gray was at running back, and he just took the ball and ran through a couple guys. He didn't get in on the first their second handoff. They got in on third down. Uh, great work by the defense staying firm you know, in a goal line situation. Pretty much was putting together a full goal line stand before Gray got in on third down. But that's the kind of guy that you don't have 
on your roster outside of him. And, you know, like Gribble said, I, I think if you want more balance in types of running backs and personnel that you have, uh, he could definitely bring some value. And so far he's proven nothing but good things. And I think with, you know, potentially more reps in these preseason games and maybe in these joint practices upcoming against the Colts, he could maybe create himself a spot where two weeks ago he wasn't on anybody's radar because he was hurt. So definitely a nice uh, development from him. Can we talk a little bit about Carriage? Go back to him over the weekend uh, and acquisition here for the Browns and uh, a lot of pieces moving parts maybe toward the back end of that roster. And uh, friend of uh, friend of ours, Orson Charles, unfortunately is out looking in and bringing in some different players and whatnot. But Carriage, a guy they brought in and looked good right away, other than the fact that he might need to have some work done on the helmet to keep it on his head. <laughs> uh, everything else, it was a very good-looking day for him. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because he's now the first true fullback on your roster, the first one since Danny Vitale from yeah. last year. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah. is a, this is a true fullback. You know, oh, with Danny. number in the 40s and everything. You know, he looks like it doesn't. You won't mistake this guy for a tight end. And while Orson Charles has played a lot of fullback in his career, he still was truly a tight end at at, at heart and the side had the size and everything like that. The interesting thing is what happened after practice. Freddie Kitchens talking about it. I think it was both they like having a fullback, but he could also see a roster where he doesn't have a fullback. So it, it'll be on carriage, I guess, and maybe some of the other roster groups who you really want to keep, who you don't. Uh, where it comes down to if they decide if they need a fullback or not on this team. But he really, he's the only one, now that Orson's gone, he really is the only one on the roster that is a true, true fullback. And in typical fullback fashion, he loses his helmet and continues blocking. Holy mo! The, the pile went down, and I'm, I'm looking around because I saw his helmet come off, and I'm like, he did not stop. Is he at the bottom of that pile without a helmet on currently? I've seen that happen before, and it's really nasty. So, A, it's good that he got out, the, out of there unscathed. And yeah. B, demonstrates how bad he wants a job. I mean, all these guys are battling, but leave it to a fullback in the in the classical sense who, who goes in there and clears a hole and loses his helmet and keeps fighting all the way to the end. All right, so with a guy like that, you know, clearly it's about his ability to block first and foremost, but then you got to factor in probably special teams. Can he play on special teams? Can he be productive on special teams, which – if you want to make the team, you Orson gotta, Charles is very valuable on special teams. Yeah. Exactly, and then the other thing is when your number is actually called to make a play offensively that doesn't require a block. Whether it's a catch, whether it's a run, can you make those kinds of plays? I feel like. well, he did have some experience in Green Bay where they actually did utilize a fullback in that sense for many years. A guy like John Kuhn comes to mind, and there's been others who have fit that sure. mold. So that could you could see him make a play. We haven't seen it in camp yet because the opportunities have been limited. He hasn't been here for very long, but. Perhaps we see that in a preseason game. You know, maybe you see something where you run a little play action out of an offset eye, and then all of a sudden Joe Carriage leaks out into the flat, and you dump it off to him, and he picks up eight to ten yards and runs a guy over in the process. I mean, that just adds another dimension to your team, and I think it's a little bit less expected when it's a fullback as opposed to a tight end lining up back there. Uh, when when it comes to just looking at personnel and trying to predict what they might want to do, and as we know, Freddie Kitchens loves to run play action. And he loves to go with multiple tight end sets. And if you could get a, f a fullback involved in these uh, packages and, and just expand further expand the opportunities for his offense, I think it would be a good idea. But, again, he emphasized it today. They're going to run the football first. They're going to be a run-first team. And I think a fullback helps you out with that. You know, I, I might be in, in you know, an old-school old type in this regard, but I've always been a fan of running behind a fullback, a guy who can open a hole. And so far he seemed to be the physical player that could do that. All right. It's, it, well, it's one thing I'll bring up. He's not here to make plays. He's got one career rush Correct. for zero yards, one catch for three yards. But I feel like in the Freddie Kitchens offense, you're eligible for anything. It could be three and catches. It, yeah. <laughs> well, and that, exactly. But it, it, if your number is called, can you make the play? Right. And I think that that's, I think that will be something to look at well, here over these next. Now three I, I could be off base here, but your two biggest nemesis in the division are big fullback teams. Yeah, the, the Steelers, Steelers and the Ravens. Steelers with Roosevelt Knicks and and the Ravens with Patrick Ricard. And they had Kyle Juszczyk, too, before that. And he was an awesome fullback as well. So. Juszczyk, more of a playmaker than Knicks, yeah. too. I mean, but it's, it's interesting. I mean, this is, everyone talks about a style of football that is played in the AFC North. Freddie Kitchens has brought that up a lot. Baker Mayfield has brought that up when he was asked if they could go no huddle all the time. Maybe this is something where this guy is going to be here to stay. Sure. All right. So we, we're gushing about the offense for the last nine minutes. What did the defense do right? What did they do wrong? in today's practice. Shook, we'll start with you. I think that what they did right was the goal line situation. They were extremely physical. There was a lot of beef up front. You had Daniel Equali, you had 
uh, Devereaux, Lawrence, you had Carl Davis, you had a lot of hefty guys up there who were trying to plug gaps. And I mean, you stand close enough there, you can hear helmets and pads popping, and they yeah. were popping. That was full go. That was man on man, my will over your will. I'm going to beat you, move you these two yards. I need to move you, open enough room. My running back's going to probably run over me into the end zone. To and they the did ground. Good, yeah, exactly. And they did that. Uh, they did a really good job in that scenario and made it really tough on the offense. So I think that was probably what they did best today. Uh, from their standpoint, what but, did they struggle? Or go ahead, Grover. I mean, this could. I mean, can't this just be what the natural evolution of what this team is going to be? Yeah. I'm not saying it's a knock on the defense. I mean, there wasn't all these expectations and hype on this team because of the defense. defense. I mean, this is all about what you did on offense in the off season, and you know, it, early in camp, the defense was getting the better of the offense, and then the offense has started really f- feeling more comfortable. And I think at the end of the day. Ultimately, we think this team is probably going to be ranked better in a lot of offensive statistical categories than defense. Not saying it's a knock on the defense. I think it's going to be a pretty good defense. But ultimately, the reason that there's so much hype and excitement is that people think this can be a top five offense. Well, that too. And, and the, the way practice usually just naturally tends to, to lean in this day and age is the offense. Because when you come out there, what are you trying to do? You're trying to execute your game plan or you want to work on things offensively that you're going to then take to the game. The defense is doing that side of it as well. But because you know they are tackling the ground in some periods, not all periods, the speed of it, just the, the, the tempo of a practice when you're playing against your own teammates is going to naturally lean a little bit in favor of the offense. So I don't think there was anything really wrong that the defense did today. Did they miss a couple coverages? Yeah, maybe, but I think it was more the offense making good plays than the defense making big mistakes. So I think overall, one of the better practices we've seen so far. Defensively, what are our expectations going into Indianapolis? What pressure. do you want to see if you over these two practices? Not so much the game. The game is what what it is. It's the second preseason game. Uh, but these two practices, what do we what do we expect? What do we want to see? I think your big test is how well can you play against this offensive line. This is an offensive line that was remade in part by acquiring two you know first and second round picks last year in Quentin Nelson, who was an All Pro. And uh, Braden Smith, who also you know played a big part on this offensive line, Mark Lewinsky did a good job at guard for them as well. They've got Ryan Kelly, they've got Anthony Costanzo. That's a really good, really strong five, and uh, and I think that it's going to be a great test for this front four that we're so excited about, provided that they're all healthy and are participating. But I mean, Miles Garrett off the edge, we all know how good he is. But Anthony Costanzo has the potential to be a top 10, 15 tackle, so this can be a good test for him. Then on the inside, you've got that Quentin Nelson. Does he face off? Does he double team uh, with Ryan Kelly on a Sheldon Richardson? How does Larry Ogunjobi play against whoever they have at right guard, whether it's Glowinski or somebody else? And, you know, you look at those all those matchups. You want to see how this front four really plays against that great offensive line. I thought it was the best offensive line or one of the top three in football last year. So I think you start from there and then move outward. We're not going to get the best test against uh, the defensive backfield because it's sounding like Andrew Luck's not going to practice. But you're going to get a lot of that in one-on-ones, too. That's the beauty of these joint practices is you're going to see – you know, Miles get a shot against, you know, a Costanzo or, or whoever they're playing at tackle. You're going to see that uh, in those individual and group sessions. While, while Baker Mayfield's in 7-on-7 seven seven over here against the Colts secondary, that's what you're going to see over there. So I think you should pay a lot of attention to the trenches this week. I'd like to see Denzel Ward versus T.Y. Hilton. I think that's something he is, he's yet to go up against a, 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 him in any games like that. Uh, I think if there were any games where – Denzel had issues last year. It was maybe against the type of receiver like a like a T.Y. Hilton. Antonio Brown in that second game gave gave Denzel some some problems in, in Pittsburgh. So I'm interested to see those kind of one on one matchups. And I I would just personally not like to see him run rough shot on our defense like he did two years ago. Correct. I also like I also think a big test for this defense this year. The biggest weakness that's had for years was guarding tight ends. The Colts list two tight ends on their depth chart. They have a really good one in Eric Ebron, so they like to use the tight ends. So this is a big test for your linebackers that are hopefully going to be better in coverage and another potential showcase opportunity for Mac Wilson, who seems to like that part of the job the best. What about on the offensive side of the ball? What are our keys this week? What do we want to see? Gribble, we'll start with you. I mean, I'll be interested to see how involved Odell's going to be. Today was another practice where he wasn't really out there all that much. I wonder wonder if you're going to show the full – the sh- are we going to show the full offense in, in one of these practices? And I think that's the full offense when you have Odell and Jarvis out there uh, and Richard as your number three wide receiver. We haven't seen a ton of those looks in the last few practices. Uh, so I'll, I'll be interested to see when, when you, which practice you take the most serious, whether it's the Wednesday or the Thursday session. 
and then I want to see what you really look like good on good and if it is coming as easy as it did against Washington. It's not going to, but I would like to just see continued success in that regard and, and, and hopefully your offensive line holds up. And I think that's that's the big question mark with this offense right now in general. Uh, and if Baker has time or even a little bit of time, you, you should be all right. This is a defense that was very zone heavy and bend but don't break last year. So I want to see how Baker Mayfield sits back and can he pick apart the zone? Can he find his open guys? He's got all the talent in the world with the receivers he'll be throwing to to be able to do that. So perhaps this is the first time we get to see this offense really unleashed. But beyond that, um, I also want to see how well the interior linemen get to second level because Darius Leonard is a tackling machine. He was all over the field as a rookie last year, and it's, it's vitally important that when you double team the nose or whoever is on the interior, that you get one of those guys off the second level and you make sure that none of those linebackers are clean on every play. Otherwise, you're not going to move the football at all because you're not going to be able to run the ball because you're going to be there to make the tackle every time. So very important. And, and it'll also be a good barometer of where Eric Cush is as, a, as the starting right guard. Can he, when, when they're ace blocking on this nose or whatever, can he, or if it's the center, if it's J.C. Treader, depending on who's got the leverage, can one of those two break off and get to the linebacker successfully enough for you to move the football on the ground? Any final thoughts? I mean, obviously, kickers and punters, it's a big week for both of them. Th- this will be three days of stressful environment situations. So it'll be good to see how they perform in that situation. But, I mean, everything else, it, it's full go. And let's see where we're at against a team with expectations. I'm just more interested to see what really does happen if there's a fight. <laughs> because we saw what happened when there was a fight at this practice that everyone ran. So if there's a fight at this practice, do both teams run? Or is it just going to be the Browns who have that's instituted the policy that they're going to stop practicing and they're going to run? So are like, would the Browns stop just start running and the Colts just watch? Or are both teams? coaches in on this yeah as a disciplinary reason like that's uh, I'm, I'm very curious because i mean I, I was saying this earlier today the the teams aren't going to be tackling to the ground and that to me can maybe lead to even more hostility towards each other because yeah. there's different interpretations of how far is too far sure. with the physicality so it's going to take a lot of self-control to avoid some of these kind of scraps but you got 180 guys out there I, I, some it just feels inevitable in these kind of s- scenarios, you know. You, for the for the team's sake, you hope it doesn't happen, so you can practice in a normal fashion and not to stop anything. But when there's this many guys out there, this many guys fighting for jobs, and also guys going up against guys they'd never seen in their life before, and and you know think that they're getting rubbed, <laughs> getting hit one way that they shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. just there's a lot of ingredients there for some scraps, and and honestly. There haven't been too many in the, the two joint practices I've been a part of with the Browns. There haven't been too, too many, but there's some moments where it gets a little tense. I can just think about it now. Like, just think about the, the, the mental part of it where you're – this guy, first off, he's not on my team. I don't know him. I have no relationship with him. Secondly, he's getting in my neck a little bit. Maybe, you know, maybe we're in the trenches a little bit, and I'm, I'm blocking, and he's trying to get my, my hands off of me and gets in my neck, or he's doing something that I don't like. After a while, it's hot enough out there. It's warm. Uh, I might might be taking it's a shot. The coach is getting in your yeah. Or I might I might take you it. to the ground and it, we might tussle a little bit. I, I mean that's that's pretty common. So I wouldn't be surprised if that then started a bigger fight. But the big thing is here, I think, is Freddie Kitchens punishes these players when they get into a fight because they are all on the same team, not because of we're fighting each other, but because we're practicing penalties. We're making mistakes while practicing with each other. If you're practicing against another team, and if, say, they incite something, then you're defending your team, right? So maybe he defends his team, and it's not a, a disciplinary thing, but a matter of, you know, we got to go back yeah. each other up. I, I, I almost wonder if these guys are too tired. <laughs> like I, you, <laughs> you always see these fights early in camp when there's a lot more energy. Yeah, You don't see these fights, like, later in camp. Like, it's always the first few days in pads – where guys are still not like just aching and and uh, asleep at any moment they're not on the field like maybe that plays into this maybe not being as hostile as we think it might be maybe if it was last week it might be a it little more physical it has been a brutal camp i will say it, it, it the, really the, has. the number of guys passed out on the couches downstairs has gone up significantly in the last few days yeah. i saw couches in the side in the chairs hallway outside pushed of the together room. i'm like where, where did yeah. that come oh yeah from? chairs pushed together to make like makeshift beds yeah the whole nine they're, they're, we might be seeing tired. every position group get an rv next year it is uh, <laughs> it's a park a whole park of, of, of RVs. Yeah, I think, I think it, uh, it has been a long camp. It will be interesting to see. And all it takes is one guy interpreting someone's move as hostile, 
and a brawl can break out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's camp. That's and Freddie football. said it today. Freddie said they can fight if they want to. They know what's going to happen if they do. Right. So I guess we'll wait and see and see how that all plays out. It's time for us to drive to Indianapolis, and we will join you on Wednesday from Indy. Uh, best podcast available will come to you Wednesday and Thursday, and then we'll be back with you on Monday. So we're looking forward to going out there and seeing all of you and seeing two great teams hit the football field together. For Andrew Gribble, for Nick Shook, I'm Jason Gibbs. This has been the best podcast available.